most of the places we go, it's, it's a pretty time of the year to go to anyway. You know, in the fall. All right, y'all ready? This is session number seven. And uh, we're talking about the book of Psalms. We're going to try to get at least eight sessions out of this. I think that that will probably, probably wrap us up. We're on page number 30 now, and we're going to talk about a source of messianic confirmation. The Psalms provide a lot of material concerning the Messiah, and, uh, and they provide a lot of confirmation concerning Christ and His coming and uh, His millennial kingdom and so forth. <clears throat> Just before His ascension, Jesus taught His apostles that in the Psalms there the, were messianic prophecies that He fulfilled. In Luke 24, 44... Um, let's flip over there real quick. We're going to read several scriptures in this particular session. So, if you want to get your Bibles ready. Luke 24, verse 44, it just quickly says, And then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all these things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Okay? So Jesus here is uh, um, saying to his disciples or to the apostles that the Psalms were mis are um, good evidence of the uh, prophecies and that he was the one who fulfilled them. And this is uh, Luke 24, 44. We want to realize that the Psalms are filled with messianic prophecies that find their fulfillment in Jesus of Nazareth. And then we can use the Psalms in two ways. Um, as a book of evidences confirming our faith in Jesus as the Christ who is the promised Messiah and as additional sources of insight into our Lord's suffering and glorious triumph. Uh, so we have two ways there. We, we're going to attempt to list some of the many fulfilled prophecies found in Psalms concerning the Messiah and to stress their value in confirming our faith during this session today. These messianic prophecies in the Psalms fulfilled in Jesus um, basically, the majority of these prophecies have to do with his passion. His re uh, first of all, let's look at uh, his rejection by both the Jews and the Gentiles. And uh, by the kings of the earth, we find that Herod, Pilate, and the Sanhedrin all rejected him. In Psalms chapter 2, we've actually read that one, that psalm, a time or two today already. So I'm not going to turn to Psalms chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But uh, it begins by saying, why does the heathen rage? You remember that? And then, uh, but let's, let's do look at Acts chapter 4, verse 23 through 28. And to be, to be specific, we actually read parts of this already too. But I, I do want to touch on this part. Acts chapter 4, 23 through 28. This is, <clears throat> this is uh, right after the dispersion of the, of the uh, church and the leaders of the church and when they were scattered due to persecution. And uh, verse 23 says, And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is therein. Uh, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why do the nations rage? And this is actually quoting that psalm that, we, we, uh, that is also given here as a reference that it alludes to. Um, and the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So um, here we have scriptural evidence from the Psalms and here from the book of Acts that uh, Jesus is rejected by Herod Pilate, the Sanhedrin, um, as the king of Jews. And then, of course, by his own family in Psalm 69, 8 and John 7, 2. And basically, it says, for, it says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. So, Jesus' own family, you know, 
had trouble with believing in who he was at first. Now, later we know that James and Jude came to believe in him, and they actually wrote, uh, you know, parts of the New Testament. <coughs> he was betrayed by his own friend in Psalms 41, 9. Let's look at that one before we go to the New Testament. Uh, it says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread and lifted up his heel, uh, has lifted up his heel against me. So he's indicating here someone that he was close enough to to, to eat together with. Turned, his, uh, turned against him. And then Matthew 26, 20 through 25 is the reference in the New Testament to that. And of course, Matthew 26 is a reference in, in the, uh, relating to the Passion Week. Uh, Matthew 26, 20. And when evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was, be, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, You have said it. Okay, so we know it was Judas. That's being referred to here both in the psalm and here, of course, in this passage. It's clear. Then thirdly, we have his silence under rejection and false accusation. In uh, Psalms 38, verses 11 through 14. Everybody okay? Is this too much turning for you? Verses 11 through 14. My, my loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague, and my relatives stand afar off. Those also who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all the day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear, and I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. Thus I am like a man who does not hear, and in whose mouth is no response. Okay, that's the psalm. And then Matthew 26 again. Verse 56. Just one verse there. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then said the disciples, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Okay. And then verse 58 through 63. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest <coughs> courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to, put, and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, and then of course there's 27, 11 through 14. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priest and the elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. So we have here the silence 
uh, <clears throat> that Jesus displayed under rejection and false accusation. He just kept his peace, you know. And, uh, and the, the Psalms, as we read, prophesied that this would be the case. And then, of course, we gave you the scriptural evidence in the New Testament where it is exactly what he did. It is exactly what happened. And what we see here is uh, the, the actual biblical historical account. And you remember from last month, New Testament literature, there is basically no um, actual, original, or copies that are more credible than the New Testament documents. I mean, they are so, so authentic and credible. So when, when, you, have, uh, when you have the kind of evidence that you have about uh, the New Testament and then Jesus, it's, man, you know, it's so verifiable. Then we have the insults, the buffeting, the spitting, and the scourging that Jesus endured. Psalms 35, verses 15 through 16. That's a fairly short passage. <clears throat> but in my, adver in my adversity they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me, and I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease. And ungodly mockers at feast, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Okay, that's speaking of Jesus um, and uh, as he's being attacked. And then over in Matthew 27... Verse 26 through 31. And then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat, a, spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when, he had mocked, and when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Okay, so <clears throat> we have this evidence here. And then uh, it, we have the events surrounding his crucifixion, which is very, it's very thorough and very complete here. We have the cries upon the cross of Jesus. And what I think I'll do here is, um, I think I'll read this portion of Psalms 22 completely, because that's going to cover most of it. Instead of jumping back and forth, it'll be easier on all of us. So let me just read uh, this, this first portion of Psalms 22, which you'll get most of it. Okay? Uh, let's see. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. My mother's womb you have been. My, from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my mouth or my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They took 
They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horn of the wild oxen. I'm going to stop right there. I think that covers pretty much most of it. In this way, I think we've covered most of those in Psalms 22 that speak prophetically to this. And then in Matthew um, 27, specifically, is where most of it is uh, reiterated or covered to express where it's a fulfillment from Psalms. It'll be over in there. Okay. And what we find here in Matthew is that he cries upon the cross in verse 46 of 27. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay. And then we have the mocking by the enemies. Um, and this is verses 39 through 44. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it three days, and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest, also mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and he will believe him and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Okay. Now, his physical agony, um, we don't actually have a reference to that. And then his being pierced in the side in Psalm 16. 22, 16. The casting of his lots for his clothing. We find that in verses 35 through 36. Where the scripture says, And then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and, my, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Okay. Um, the uh, offer of gall and vinegar, verse 34 of 27. Let's see, I think I read that one. Let's see. Yeah, I did. And then, uh, not a bone to be broken. This is over in John chapter 19. You remember from our teaching last month in the book the New Testament, when we talked about John, we discussed that there, there are some specifics covered concerning the Passion Week in the book of John, by John, that were not covered by the other writers of the other synoptic Gospels. John gives us some details that we want to uh, know and, and understand, and he covers some things for us. John chapter 19, verse 31 through 37. For because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear. And immediately blood and water came out. And he who had, has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may be, believe. For these things were done, that the scriptures should be fulfilled, and not one of his bones was broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Okay? Um, his prayer for his enemies. And that's found in Luke 23, 34. Everybody still awake? Well, y'all are doing good. Luke 23, 
34. And then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Uh, his final words, verse 46 of that same chapter. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And death to be in the prime of, uh, of his life. And of course, that was Psalms 89, 45. Let's look at that. The days of his youth you have shortened. You have covered him with shame. The days of his youth you have shortened. Death was to be voluntary. And how many of you know Jesus laid down his life? It wasn't taken from him, amen? We know that he could have actually, as the scripture says, called 10,000 angels. Um, amen. Psalms 40, verses 6 through 8. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. And your law is written within my heart. I proclaim the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. Anyway, that, that covered what we were trying to read. Um, and then Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Matthew 26. Thirty-six through forty-six. And then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And then he came to his disciples, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Amen. Jesus' death was definitely voluntary. Amen. He understood what was required of him. And he was willing to say to the Father, Thy will be done. Amen? Amen. Um, the Psalms also speak of his glorious triumph. And uh, this begins by Psalms 16, declaring that his resurrection from the dead. And of course, Acts chapter 2, 24 through 31, as, uh, you know, speaking to that and the fact that he was resurrected from the dead. We'll read Psalm 16. Psalm 16, 8 through 10. I have set the Lord always before me, because He is at my right hand, and I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see 
corruption. Praise God. Mm, that's a powerful promise, isn't it? The, the older I get, the more I hang on to them kind. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Um, his ascension into heaven, Psalm 68, 18. And we'll look at both of these here. Psalm 68, 18. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. The reason I wanted to read both of these is I want you to notice the similarities. And Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Okay. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led, captive, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might feel all things. You notice, you notice the similarity? What you see there is you see... One is a prophetic psalm. The other one is the fulfillment of that psalm. This is the Apostle Paul saying that what was written in the psalms has come to pass. That he did ascend. Amen. And that he did give gifts to men. Praise God. That's powerful, isn't it? His coronation to sit at the right hand of God and to begin his reign. This would be Psalms 110. This is another powerful psalm. Psalms 110, verses 1 through 3. I know y'all are getting tired. It's after lunch. <laughs> Psalms 110, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. For your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauty of holiness. From the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. That's a powerful psalm. Amen. Praise God. Um, that's a prophetic psalm to, to the Lord. And we're not going to read all these references, but these are powerful references uh, that are basically showing the fulfillment of this in Christ. Amen. Okay. Uh, his priesthood, Psalms 110, verse 4. I'm just, we're right there open at it. We just read it. The Lord has shown and will not relent. What, what am I doing here? Yeah, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. I can't hardly read this, but the print's little and my glasses are old and so are my eyes. Um, <laughs> you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Kezedek. Okay? So, again, powerful. Amen? Praise God. Uh, let's see. Ascension, where am I at here? Oh, I skipped one, didn't I? No, I didn't. Okay, his judgment of the nations, Psalms 110, verses 5 through 6. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. Amen. So that's judgment of the nations. These are speaking of the glorious triumph of the Lord. Amen? His dominion. Amen. So these are uh, messianic prophecies that are found in Psalms. There are more that are found in the Psalms, but here's, this was a variety of just a few here that we were able to share and look at together. Um, we want to just look quickly at the value of messianic prophecy. The value uh, of messianic prophecy just kind of in general... Uh, Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. Uh, God used it to confirm His existence. And then Isaiah 46, 9 through 11 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, 
and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Praise God. That's powerful, amen. So he identifies himself as the God of prophecy, as one who is able to declare his plans in advance and then have the power to bring it to pass or to bring it about, amen. So he's an awesome God. God takes responsible for what he says that he will do. And he takes responsibility for bringing it to pass. Sometimes, you know, prophecy comes forth or we read a promise in the scripture and we get nervous. You know, well, is God really going to do what he said? Listen, God's not nervous. Amen? God's going to do what God says he's going to do. And here's the comforting thing. It ain't up to you. We get the feeling sometimes that because I call myself a Christian, it's my responsibility now to make God responsible for what he said he would do. No. God can take care of his word. He can take care of his promises. What we're to do is proclaim his word. We're just to speak truth. It's up to God to back it up. Amen? Hallelujah. And that's comforting. And, and that's called faith. That's what faith really is. Look, man, when, I, when, I, when you preach God's word, when you teach God's word, you tell it boldly with faith and confidence, and you just smile. Because any power that's in you is power from the Lord and from the Holy Spirit. You can't make it happen. And you're, all you're doing is creating yourself anxiety and frustration if you think that you're responsible now for making it happen. You know what is the root of that? Pride and fear. That's what's at the root of it. We're not responsible for God's word. We're responsible to be obedient to God. Preach the word. In season, not a season. Well, the word of God says thus and so. And I tell you what, praise God, I believe it to be true. Now, step back. Amen. That's what makes it so powerful. Let him prove it. Amen. Let God be God. Amen. That's why his kingdom is so awesome, amen? Praise God. So God used it to confirm his spokesman. We know that the true prophets, by applying the test, of fulfilled prophecy. Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 22. Let's look over there at that. Most of you know this. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Well, well, and if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord? If the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Well, I think that's pretty clear. Amen? So, you know, God's simply saying to God takes all the burden off of us. We're just to be responsible to Him and to be faithful and loyal to Him. And when God gives us something to say, you say it. Amen? And then let God be the one who's responsible for it. But just be sure when you talk, it's God's business. Amen? And as far as uh, those of us on the other end of it, some, it seems like for some reason there's always been that little group of people who felt like they were the Holy Ghost police. You know? And it was their job to go around judging everybody and, and critiquing every word and every prophecy and every message and everything, you know. And, then, and they, want, they want to judge everybody. You know what? God will take care of it, amen? God will take care of it. And, and everybody will know what's, what's real and what's not. And everybody will know what's up and what's down, amen? It don't take long, does it? it don't take long. So only those moved by the Holy Spirit could accurately foretell the future as God would bring it about. 2 Peter 1.21. Now, this is a powerful verse right here. Anybody in this house recognize it before we get to it? 
Somebody ought to know it. Whoa, whoa, thank you. Thank you. Second Peter. Come on, Peter, where are you? Second Peter one twenty one. I always had a special love for this verse. Second Peter one twenty one. I'm going to back up to verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Some, the old translation says the day star. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So what are we saying here anyway? Well, we're just simply saying it's the Holy Spirit that is the one who speaks and gives prophecy. And this right here, this book right here, the Bible, that's the sure word of prophecy. Amen? This is the sure word of prophecy. You ain't going to go wrong with this one. Amen? This word of prophecy supersedes all words of prophecy. All words of prophecy are screened through and filtered through this word of prophecy. Anybody ever gives a word of prophecy, whether it's to an individual, whether it's to a church, or to a city, or a nation, or the world, it's screened through this filter right here. And if it can't stand up to this filter right here, out the door. It don't fly. That's what the Bible teaches right here. Amen. That's good preaching, Brother Lee. Amen. Amen. So the value of Messianic prophecy, well, it helps identify the one who is truly the Messiah, God's anointed one. You know, there's a lot of Messiahs in the world. The Jews were always looking for a Messiah. They're still looking for one. And he's already here. Amen. And they're still looking for one. The Old Testament, including the Psalms, has approximately 330 prophecies concerning the Messiah. And Jesus has fulfilled every one of them. The mathematical probability, you'll like this, of it being a coincidence is astounding. The probability of any man who has lived since the beginning of time fulfilling just eight. Everybody say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Every one of y'all can count. That was good. The probability of any person fulfilling just eight of the prophecies has been calculated as one in whatever that number is. I don't even know how to say that number. And I had to take math in college. What is that number? I don't even know. That looks about like the, 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 about like the, the national debt, don't it? That's too many, isn't it? That's too many. The probability of fulfilling just 48 is 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Counting at the rate of 250 units per minute, it would take us 19 million times 19 million times 19 million years just to count that high. Who wants to get started? Come on now. I mean, that, you know, come on. So it's easy to see why the apostles used the scriptures to prove that Jesus was the Christ. Paul's custom was to use the prophecies of the scriptures to demonstrate that Jesus was the Christ. Peter did the same.